All right, guys. Um, this talk is about uh, challenges uh, uh, observed um, when testing with the fast tests and block tests and scaling that. Um, so first thing I'd like to request is that pl please just refer to it as a fast test rather than exit fast test because even at LSFMMs, you know, I've been present at LSFMMs where new, new file system developers really don't understand and still know that you can use XFS tests to test all file systems. So, you know, I think it would just help, you know, to, to make it generic. Um, I took a, a poll on Twitter a while ago about how long people think it might take to stabilize a file system, and it seems people think it takes about two years to stabilize a new file system. So, clearly that's a bit wrong. It takes about like 10 years, give or take. Depending on, depending on who you ask, but give or take, it takes about 10 years if you're introducing a new file system. Uh, so proper file system design is really difficult, right? Really, really difficult. Uh, so whenever you're, you know, designing something new, just, you know, have patience, right? Um, so how about testing, though? Can we help in the testing world for stabilizing file systems? So I, I figured I'd set as, a, as an objective many, many years ago to try to help with this problem. And I figured one of the problems that I could tackle was reducing the amount of time it takes to test a file system. Uh, once I had that done, I figured, well, why not also uh, use this to also test adding new block features. So that's, this is why this is now an FS test and block test talk too. Um, so one of the differences with other areas of the kernel is that determinism in FS test and block test is really, really low. And to give you an example, K unit tests are highly deterministic, extremely deterministic, right? Um, Self-tests in the kernel are, have higher determinism, but it doesn't mean that, you know, they're always going to be, um, you know, it doesn't mean that you're always going to have success. So sometimes some self-tests, like the K-mod test is an example, sometimes you may have issues and you have to run them over and over and over again. FS tests and block tests, however, can be extremely non-deterministic, but produce really, really catastrophic failures. Give you guys some examples. Well, actually, before I get into examples, I think um, if there's any takeaway about some of these things, I, I'd really like you guys to, you know, think, of, think about this, you know, little graph and understand that the, the time and involvement for testing, you know, really needs to be divided properly if, you, if we want to take this seriously. So about 25% of the time really should be dedicated towards test design. 25% uh, tracking results, uh, Twenty-five percent also for reporting bugs, uh, and then twenty-five percent also for fixing low-hanging fruit. Uh, and I'll describe a bit of some, what some of these things are. We're, I think, pretty good at test design, um, and that's it, really. Um, so, uh, in order to to help with this, you know, obviously I worked on a project it's called KDevOps. I try to address uh, variability uh, by using KConfig. Um, it basically also addresses bring up, uh, whether or not, or not you want to use uh, local virtualization or use the cloud. Um, and then for management, I basically just use Ansible. But this talk is not about uh, this project. This is about lessons learned from that experience in actually scaling testing and automating it. To give you an example though, um, here's a leap 15.3 failure. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, leap 15.3 also means that it's a SLE bug too. Uh, because there's binary compatibility between the kernels and uh, user space. Um, so this is just an example where you have an ext4 failure failing one out of 300 times. So you have to run the test about 300 times in order to get it. When I asked some file system developers how many times I have you ran a fast test in a loop, they look at me kind of puzzled because it seems like not many people do that. Well, it turns out if you do run a fast test in a loop, you eventually will get a failure. Um, here's a, an example in block tests. Uh, fails about one out of 80 times, for instance, and it produces an RCU stall, CPU stall. Uh, and this is a recent one. Uh, I, I'd like to also thank the folks who, you know, did the analysis of, of what likely, you know, could fail here. Uh, is Sin Ch I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Is he here, Kawa? Is he here? Awesome, thank you, that was really cool. Um, and then, you know, Klaus is also a Kimi developer. Uh, and then he ended up uh, also looking at this, these issues. And it, basically, it seems like Kimi uh, zone reset is super slow when resetting all zones. 
So that, that could be optimized a bit. Um, but there's a few lessons that we can learn from this you know, case, right? One is that future optimizations are obviously needed in chemia for resetting old zones. But the other one is that uh, the false positive CPRCU stalls are helpful, right? Because it, it can also tell us when user space is doing something really stupid. Here's another example. This is a, let's see, a block 009 failure. This failed one out of 669 times, for instance. And when this was reported, it was kind of like really not understood what the heck was going on. And it took about eight months to really figure out what was going on. Really, it was just like ignored by folks. So this was fixed in 5.12, and Giancarlo has a series of, his series of patches that also can be backported. But like in, in Amir's last talk, for instance, of you know, merging stable fixes, I mean, granted, it was for file systems, but with block layer, it's also complex to merge some changes. So uh, for stable, you, know, you can't really merge Giancarlo's patches as is. It's really complex. Uh, just to give you an example, so you know, fixing some of these issues on older kernels is really, really difficult. Here's a, a, a low-hanging fruit example. This one was really odd because it was failing for all these different XFS configurations in, in with really different failure rates. It was just really puzzling. But it was a very consistent type of failure, which is SCSI debug. Well, it turns out that SCSI debug, um, if you guys are familiar with SCSI, it's a pain in the ass when you're trying to quiesce things, right? Um, but long, long story short is that there was a long-standing kernel module user space issue. You basically tickle anything with the module ref count, you basically just can't remove it. So that was a long-standing issue present in modules since forever. Uh, so that, that'll eventually be fixed in KMOD with a patient module remover. But, um, but still, there's some lessons to learn here. Um, I'm, 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 FS I'm, tests I'm, I'm, and block tests should not require modules. But right. Pardon, um, so but as I think folks has, had pointed out before, you know, that we, sorry. Um, but I mean, uh, you can't remove it because if there's a no, it's still a reference held by the module, which is okay. And I think that's perfectly valid. No, 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 right. But the, the thing is that if you want to get to the point where you want to create high confidence and in, 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 in your baseline, you have to remove the module currently doesn't mean that you, you... I'm, I'm not arguing against removing the module. It is if that module in, uh, has some configuration, that configuration might well keep the module busy. So you first have to clean up the configuration. Of course, of course. So I, I, of course, this is totally understood. The problem, though, is that we expect that this is going to work, and it doesn't. And basically, all right. your tests just stop. Right? So, so it, would, it would help also if we just don't require the modules. And yes? So yeah, I, I'm aware of this problem. It's been pointed out several times. So currently the block test, especially in VME category, they assume to test the module removal because there are so many modules involved when it comes to NVMe or fabrics or just NVMe host and a target. And that interdependency has significant impact on various reference counting we do on the host side and on the target side. So what we can do is to move the test cases to just test the module ref count separately or in separate category so you can skip it. Well, so let's think about this, right? You know, what, what's really desired is to quiesce. <coughs> it's not really to remove the module. Removing the module shouldn't really be a requirement. For instance, the uh, null block, right, uh, added, you know, the, the folks that added configFS support to essentially just remove stuff, right? That's the way to go. SCSI debug already has that too. Uh, can we do that for the NVMe modules, for instance? No, that's what I'm saying. Because there are so many reference counting is being done on the host side and a target side for different uh, transports. And when you remove the module, you are 100% sure none of the recent changes are breaking the ref reference counting mechanism. Are you saying it's impossible? Uh, it's not impossible, but it, it is easy to introduce a bug in that path. That's what I'm saying. And that's why module removing and module loading, we made it mandatory. So we can just add separate test cases to test those scenarios mm -hmm. where you are sure that there are no bugs in reference counting and leave rest of the test cases where it just assumes that modules are loaded. 
if memory serves, SCSI debug is rather old and strange the way it's configured in that you pass the configuration of the block device that you want to create as module parameters. So it can only be configured at module load time. Uh, what if we just change SCSI debug to be configurable via configFS? Yeah, uh, my, my understanding was pointed out in the mailing list recently that it, that, that support is already there. Okay, so maybe the test should be just changed to use that and not care about loading and unloading. If we have agreement here that that's w the way to go, then absolutely. I mean, Christoph recently had, you know, requested that block tests stop requiring modules, for instance, right? So that's something to consider here. We just need some consensus that this is the way to go and we just go into it, right? This, so if we have consensus here, then great. But you're pointing out though that, you know, in NVMe, we probably have no other option but to remove the module. So if that's the case and, you know, well, the good thing though is that the mo why, patient module remover is there, right? Why, why do you need to remove the module though? Uh, so well, I, I what know. I understand is that they're testing that at the time that you're t tearing the module down that you have properly torn down okay, everything NVMe related, so they want to test the reference counting w in NVMe itself. That sounds like a test that covers uh, SCSI debugs ref counting. That, that should be a test for the SCSI debug code. That's not really an NVMe test. Well, no, well, we don't want this to is test for the NVMe debug. modules. Yeah, yeah, and I'm saying that they're not really testing what they think that they're testing. No, it's not only reference counting. We also uh, free up the work queues and resources when we unload the modules, which are global to the transport or to the target. And when we remove that, it does the cleanup. And we are sure that nothing, nothing has been broken in the cleanup path because there were bugs that we found in the cleanup path before. So we're talking about two different things, and let's not yeah. get too far in the weeds here. We have we should be making tests that test the NVMe cleanup path. Those are what those tests are. And then we have this knock-on effect thing where just because we happen to remove the SCSI debug thing, it caused test failures. That's not actually part of the test. So let's try to separate these things and make it as easy as possible that we are testing the thing that we care about and not introducing other side effects. All right, moving on, um, it seems that we have at least some consensus on the SCSI debug front. Um, NVMe, I'll just leave that alone, right? Um, other issues and challenges? Well, it turns out, um, at least on FS tests, you have the dot .bad files, and then you have also the JUnit file. It turns out, you know, sometimes you'll actually find an error present in dot .bad files, but it's not present in JUnit. So if you're processing the JUnit XML file, you probably are not capturing failures too. Likewise, if you're doing it the other way around and only capturing dot, dot .bad files, sometimes you'll actually see the failure in, in the JUnit file, but not in the bad files, for instance. So you actually have to check for both. Uh, block this is a bit better, but um, it's new, right? And there's not as many tests as FS says. But uh, one of the things that's really nice about uh, block this is that it, it also captures the dot .dmx file as well. And I think that we should be doing that in, um, in FS this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to be a little bit clear about what's going on, right? If there is a uh, nnn.bad file, but it's not marked as bad in JUnit, which probably also means it's not marked as bad when you look at the text output, that's arguably a test bug, yeah, that's a right? And we should just fix the test. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's we can problem. try to make the test runners a little bit more robust, but let's just fix the test. <laughs> That, that's definitely just a bug, right? We need to fix that shit. Great. And regarding the DMS, uh, FS tests has that keep DMS config Who's this? Where can you? Oh, hey. Has keep DMS, so you have a per test dot DMS file to check. Yeah, and like it, it saves it when it when there is an error, right? It's because our like our CI stuff saves it, and so you can look at the DMS message when fa when it fails. So. All right, so I take it there's no um, no one opposed to having adding the .dmes files to FS test, right? So it's it already exists. So it does. I, so right now it will generate the file if it detects a warning or a leak or whatever. So like if you look at the ButterFS results, you can see where we have dmessage files uploaded to the results file, the results website. Um, but you also there's another option to say always save the dmessage files. Got it. So you can you can turn that on and. Sure. Um, but by default, it only generates the message if it detects a warning, leak, all these variety of things. Great. And, I, 
And I copied that for block test. So block test does the same thing. I, I'm pretty sure it'll only save the D message if it found something bad in there. I, but I don't have an option to, to always save it. If you want that, we can add it. Great, great. All right, moving on. Uh, so to address the problem of these, uh, you know, non-determinism, the, the non-determinism on a fast test and block test, uh, essentially uh, in KDOPS you can configure uh, the steady state, which is basically how many times do you want to run a fast test or block test, for instance, in a loop. Uh, just to give you guys an idea, it takes for a setting of 100, it takes about five to six days to run that. Um, ideally, ideally you would, if there's comments or questions? What, what device? What file system? This is all file systems. No, but five, six days you're running on what device? I'm, I'm sorry, can you, can you say it again? The FS test 100 loops, you say five, six days. What's the underlying device for the test? Oh, so there is a, um, there is a bit of architectural um, design here that has to be considered. Uh, I basically use loopback devices and truncated files, and I test, I test on XFS and on ButterFS as backend for the, for the guests, and then also the sparse files are created on XFS and ButterFS. So I test on both XFS and ButterFS. It turns out that if you run the FS test in a loop, for instance, on XFS on the host, you get sometimes re results that are different than ButterFS. So I, I'm actually testing for both, and I use both XFS and ButterFS to have more coverage. So you're saying XFS and ButterFS in the guest that's running the test, or testing XFS and ButterFS in the test, in the whole. I'll, I'll explain, I'll over. explain. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you have, let's say, um, there's one server that has data one and data two partitions on the host. Data one, for instance, is XFS. Data two is ButterFS. I then create truncated files on data one to use as NVMe drives on the guest. Then, inside the guest, I also have those NVMe drives. I mount them in MKFS using XFS or ButterFS. OK, that makes sense. Thanks. I, I think I'm going to guess what question Damien was really asking, uh, or just ask my own. Uh, what could we do to get that down from five to six days? That's, to, I'm glad to you asked, it. but I think that, that I have some crazy ideas there. And no. I, when I said those but crazy ideas, some people kind of like, I'm not sure if that'll work, but I have some ideas and I'm, I, I'm not sure we'll have enough time to get some, to some of those ideas. But what if instead of being crazy, we just threw hardware at it? Yeah, so my question actually, the context was uh, five, six days, 200, 100 times when I have drives that are so big that it takes a full day to do a single write pass. So I can't even do a full run on one day. That's just where, where we are at, depending on yeah, no, what I, I, uh, I, I, I totally what, understand. Uh, this, 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 is, this, is, this is, yeah, you're right. This is totally on a, on a virtualized environment for sure, yes. I have not covered yet uh, direct raw access to devices, but that easily can be done given that you can just use PCI pass-through, right? Um, how large is the drive you're using? Would it uh, be possible so to get just move it into a RAM disk? So uh, in practice, uh, in the worst case scenario for testing all file systems, you need give or take about 50 gigs. So you can run it in a RAM disk. What's that? So you can run it in a RAM disk. You can, you know, but here's, here's the funny thing to address the, uh, your question too. I actually did that. There's no gain in running it in memory. And the reason is that FS test is so slow, it wasn't designed to be parallelized. There's no gain in running it in memory. Uh, personally, I, I like to run tests going over 16 terabyte in capacity because you can actually catch bugs over overflows with that. 4K times 4 gig, that's 16 terabytes. So. It, it'd, it'd be definitely great to optimize a fast test to be parallelized, but I think we need to think then a proper, about a proper architecture for a fast test, and, and if folks are okay with that, then by all means, let's just fucking do it, you know? This is great work, thanks. Um, when you run a fast test, and then you establish the baseline, uh, are you running the auto group, or are you running all the tests? For, for which file system? For XFS, uh, for uh, XFS and ButterFS, for example. So for XFS, although these are configurations that had failures, but pretty much I think there's, a, 
I haven't looked into this in a while, I think maybe like eight profiles, and each of, each of these basically have different uh, XFS parameters, right? So, uh, yeah, so pretty much oh, any, any possible known configuration that is important. The only one that I'm not testing right now, but I will soon is the real time because I, I'll have an interest in uh, the real time uh, stuff in a bit. But, but yeah, for ButterFS, uh, I welcome patches. Right now I'm just testing the default. Um, it should be re really easy to add um, new configurations. To add support for new test profiles, like sections, I call them sections, mm -hmm. it's pretty much just a kconfig patch. So that's I think it. one other thing that's probably worth um, making sure people understand is it really depends on uh, what your goals are for running tests, right? Uh, what I perceive is if you are a QA person who is trying for the platonic ideal of zero bugs, then yes, you may have to do a huge number of baselines and you know, you're interested in bugs that only show up one in 800 runs. Um, at a company, the problem is I could invest a lot of money trying to find those bugs. I don't have the headcount to hire to have software engineers to run down all of those bugs. Right, so. Right? so and so I think I we, we need to be very, very clear about what we do, right? I mean, you know, in our environment, we run tests constantly on the hardware that we will actually use in production because those are the bugs we care about, right? Now, I'm not pretending that I'm trying to find all bugs. I'm trying to find the bugs that will matter for my company when I'm running a kernel in production at my company. And so that's just, I have different goals than you do, right? I mean, my goal for that set of tests that I use, you know, for work, right, is to, you know, maximize bang for the buck in terms of the highest quality kernel that I can afford given the headcount that I am allocated. Totally. Right? And, 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 and it's a slightly different thing I, because you can find bugs. It's like, yes, if you told me that there's a bug in EXT4 that only triggers one in 800 times, I will ignore you because I've got bugs that fail more frequently than that, and I don't have the bandwidth to handle the ones that fail, you know, 15% of the time. Right? And, and so I think, you know, this is really good work. I'm, I'm glad that you're doing it. But I think we also need to remember that what may be appropriate for a developer who is trying to validate commits that they yes, plan yes. to so send to Linus during a pull request we, may be I, different I, than this sort of QA effort. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> time is limited, so I just want to move on. And I'd like to say that, yes, you're right, but it, it basically is it, it's, it's a matter of basically management, managing what your priorities are for sure. It, but what I also want to convey clearly is that it takes resources, as you're indicating, to properly do this and all that stuff. So yes, completely. But moving on a bit, um, so establishing a new baseline for a new file system will take about one to two months. Now, when you don't have a baseline though, a public baseline, just consider it technical debt that we have in the community. Because if we did have that, then we could just move on, right? And, and as Ted is indicating, it takes time to go and process these failures, right? Who's going to look at them? You know, if you stop every single time, just go try to address the issue, then you can run this loop, for instance, right? So one of the things you have to do then as well is also do a, a, a lazy, I'm not sure if this is in this slide now, uh, but I'll just mention now it's a lazy baseline. Basically, basically it means that, lazy baseline just means that um, once you have a failure detected in at least two types of configurations for the file system that you're testing, you expunge it for all the sections and you just move on with life. You eventually should look into what the hell happened, but you know, like I said, reporting bugs is also 25% of the time. And again, this needs to be collaborative. Yes. Uh, uh, could you do a buff, for example, at Plumbers at some conference where you're like, hey, here is, here is how you uh, use KDevOps as a developer, as a file system developer, for example, or uh, as a VFS developer. I think this would be really useful. Yeah, I do. I did submit a, uh, my talk to plumbers, so I will be talking about uh, KDevOps there and giving a demo. Cool, because, you know, I have my hacky own way of running XFS tests, but if, if I have something where I really have an automatic baseline, well, so this is also an invitation right. now um, that if folks really are interested in collaborating on this front, uh, fortunately my employer has provided a server that we can use to collaborate on this baseline for different file systems. 
Uh, so if you guys do want to collaborate on this, please let me know after this talk, and then basically we can you know move forward with that. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be giving a talk at, uh, if it get, gets accepted, you know, to plumbers about you know K DevOps. Um, so yeah, uh, like I said, stable is also you know volunteer based. I know some sub subsystems you know do the whole auto stuff, and if it works for them, great. But if you have someone like Chinner complaining about stuff, then obviously things are not going to be merged, you know, easily to to the, to the file system. So we need to do proper diligence, and for me, proper diligence is having a baseline that have a confidence of at least 100 loops for uh, FS tests, for instance, for block tests as well. Um, I'm a bit anal with testing, if you can't tell. Um, so today, another issue is that we we skip tests today that are not ap applicable, but we should probably just not skip them. If we know that they should fail, we should actually run them and annotate the failure that we should expect because we're missing an opportunity there, there to test as well. If we have consensus here on that, then we'll just go ahead and fix those issues. Or what do you mean by it. that? What what exactly would you well, be testing for? Well, one example, for? you know, in you know, one example for instance is you know you shouldn't do random write on a sequential ZNS drive, for instance. But you know, I. It should fail. Well, I don't want to crash things, right? But hey, maybe I should test it to ensure that it but does that, fail. That wouldn't mean introducing a bug in the file system code in purpose to test that. What's that? I, th I think at that point you just add a separate test that specifically tests for that. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, so do we not um, have any possibility of gains to express the failure that we should expect if we run the test? No, I, I think that, that that introduces too many, like, did it fail because it failed to, to do the right, or did it fail because some other thing failed? When we're okay. talking about that sort of thing, I, I really rather prefer okay. we go out of our way to make sure the thing that fails, failed. So, yeah, so, so if you want an example, yeah. for example, for zone FS, I do have such tests where I, I use DD to write a sector that shouldn't be written, then, then run a write on the file, and it should be working, but the file system of course fails, and that's to test the error pass in the file system. But that's not a, that yeah, a failure is expected, and what I'm testing is that uh, recovery is success successful. So that's not really the same as what you were, you were saying here. Great, thank you. So um, one of the last things I'll just mention, because I think we're out of time, is uh, yeah, you know, there's desires uh, to also have presentation Right, so I'm hoping uh, someone who does have a nice little shiny uh, presentation for results might be willing to volunteer on some of this stuff. I wouldn't call it shiny, but it's there. <laughs> hey, that's better than nothing. Yeah, I mean, it's better than nothing, that's for damn sure. But uh, yeah, I can present that later. Fantastic. Um, all systems track this, but we really ought to have a link somewhere in FS XFS tests or in a wiki so, like with ButterFS, I know what ButterFS expects because I have, you know, five or six wiki pages for different servers, what to expect and how to set it up and all that. But every file system, we need to have a central place where I can find the XT4 and, you know, all the other file systems wherever they keep their wiki that describes what it, they expect. All right, let's let's wrap this shit up. Uh, let's meet at uh, four because there's nothing there, and we can kind of hash all this stuff out as a buff and not bore everybody else to death. Thank you.